kind of music played on the oud goes back centuries. Back to the old country, as the old-timers like to say. But on the streets of Glendale, it's a fairly recent phenomenon by historical measurements. We don't know if the parents of Paul Ignatius blasted the music of Western Armenia on their Victrola in the early 1920s, but we do know his family was one of the first Armenian families in Glendale, a city that now boasts about 100,000 Armenian Americans, nearly half the city's population. In his recent memoir, Ignatius, now 97, was a trailblazer in public service among Armenian Americans, serving as the Secretary of the Navy under President Lyndon Johnson. That fact, along with having served as a commissioned naval officer during World War II, led to a distinction not many can put on their resumes, having a U.S. Navy destroyer named after him. Another first among many for Paul Ignatius. So in looking back 100 years, we recognize the Ignatius family as one of Glendale's first. But it was Martin the Armenian who was the first Armenian to arrive in America in 1618, 400 years ago. Stepan Partamian, Armenian-American historian and social critic, recently compiled a 2,000-page book on the accomplishments of Armenian-Americans, most achieved over the past 150 years, when 98% of them and their ancestors came to America. Their accomplishments stand out in academia, the arts, sports, law, media, medicine, and science. But it's really only over the past 50 years that Armenian-Americans Americans have found their footing in politics, more specifically in elective office. It was over 120 years ago that my family arrived here in the United States. And even at that time in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, one of my ancestors was an organizer, a political organizer. And the reason was that the Armenian immigrants were getting beaten up by the Norwegian immigrants who had come before them because they were taking their jobs and so on. And the police were very often siding with those who were already here uh, against the Armenians. And um, one of my ancestors, Krikor Krikorian, stood up uh, in a town meeting and it's reported in the newspapers at the time. He says, there's 500 of us here. If you give me 500 men and we go and show up at City Hall, then we'll see who they listen to. And, and the same was true in the 1890s as is true now in the 21st century. If we don't show up and participate, um, then we'll get left behind. Los Angeles City Council member Paul Krikorian has been the most successful in local government, elected in America's second most populous city. We counted more than 30 other city council members over the years, from Massachusetts to Torrance, from New York to Montebello, and Illinois to Pasadena. Glendale, of course, is now the epicenter of Armenians in local government, with four of the city's five council members being Armenian Americans. Also Armenian and elected Glendale officials are the city treasurer and the city clerk who was a young activist years ago when he first approached the woman who held the position he now holds. There was an Armenian candidate running for city council and when we approached the city clerk at the time and said, you know, hey, we want materials translated to Armenian because most of the voters who are Armenian, for them English is not their first language and if you're translating it to Spanish for the Spanish speakers to be able to understand, then it makes only sense that in Glendale, a city of roughly 35 to 40 percent population of Armenian origin, that you also translate it to Armenian. And the response given was that, well, you're considered Caucasian or white, and you know, you're not part of the federally mandated languages that were required to translate it in, and you know, good luck. There have been a number of state legislators of Armenian descent on the East Coast, like New Jersey's Chuck Haitayan and Massachusetts Speaker George Kaverian, but no state can point to the numbers in California, starting with Wally Karabian in the early 70s, who at one time served as his party's assembly leader, and a role model to so many who came after him, Chuck Pachigian, Joe Samidian, Howard Kalugian, Greg Agazarian, Steve Samuelian, and Khacho Achachian. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Currently, there's only one Armenian American in elective office in all of Sacramento, Audrey Nazarian. For me, it was important to make sure that Armenian nonprofit organizations that serve the community well uh, are also recognized by the state and are uh, appropriately supported by the state. So I'm very proud 
of uh, having secured funding for LARC Music Society, which trains hundreds of kids on a daily basis. And I was very proud to kick off the support for the Armenian Museum by securing the first million. State Senator Anthony Portentino also helped get state money for the Armenian American Museum, for which they'll break ground in Glendale in 2019. Portentino is not Armenian, but he represents more Armenian Americans than any other politician from a legislative district in the country. Earlier this year at Brand Library in Glendale, Portentino sponsored an event on the status of women in Armenia, one of many such issues on which he's been a leader. Whether it's Artsakh, the Artsakhi economy, or trying to create more trade opportunities between California and Yerevan, again, there's a natural fit between the Armenian businesses in California, in particular in my district, and those economic opportunities in Artsakh and in Yerevan. Before getting elected to serve in Sacramento, Assemblyman Nazarian served on the staffs of a council member and a congressman. Before that, he was a campaign consultant for a successful Glendale City Council candidate, among others. In the Armenian community, one of the reasons why I felt it was so important, for example, for there to be a council member in Glendale was because when you looked at the police and fire departments and you saw that there were many hardworking police officers and firefighters, but unfortunately didn't speak the language, if they're going to be addressing an emergency and if someone's life is on the line for by a few seconds, and if that they can't, uh, language is becoming a barrier, well, what is the city doing to make sure that they're addressing those issues? So it becomes a life and death issue. If there's anyone who has been the most influential behind the scenes in Glendale for the longest period of time, building a campaign infrastructure, a political machine really, it's Ellen Asatrian. For me, it's never been really about power for myself, but empowering our community to have a voice and any really marginalized community to have a voice in, in their government. And so with that respect, I've always selected candidates that I truly believed would make that difference. We met Asatrian at Sardarabad Bookstore in Glendale, a city she's worked in since arriving in America from Yerevan as a tween. By the age of 15, she was working on Rafi Manukian's successful 1999 Glendale City Council race. Since then, it's been candidates for school board, the state legislature, and Congress. Along the way, she made time to work for a combined 11 years as the executive director of the Armenian National Committee of America's Glendale chapter and as the executive director of the ANCA's entire western region. She started High Votes in 2012, and by 2017, High Votes had registered 50,000 Armenian Americans in Los Angeles County. We are the margin vote, and so we now become a powerhouse uh, with respect to candidates and elected officials that, um, whether they like to or not, are now paying attention to us and the interests that are important to us. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. I've always told our community members that, you know, it doesn't begin or end with elections, right? Um, somebody that's already elected into office needs to get re-elected. And in order for them to actually pay attention to you, you, they need to see that you have the numbers at the ballot box. And if not at the ballot box, then you at least need to be writing checks and creating partnerships uh, with other community groups to uh, create a voting block. This is the Armenian Church in Scottsdale, Arizona where a D.C.-based political advocacy group, the Armenian Assembly, was on hand over President's Day weekend to hold a town hall meeting at the local church hall to educate and motivate the Armenian-American grassroots. The Armenian Assembly is a nonpartisan uh, advocacy organization, so that means we work across the aisles. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent. We focus on the issues, and the issues are strengthening, strengthening the U.S.-Armenian relationship, making sure that politicians and their staff understand the challenges that Armenia faces, whether it's the blockades of Turkey and Azerbaijan, 
the war rhetoric and the war that's happening that Azerbaijan has launched against Armenia. You know, those are the types of issues that, that we focus on. The Armenian Assembly has also trained summer college interns in Washington, D.C. for decades. I think it's important to be active, however that is. It could be in the church, it could be in Washington, D.C., it could be in your local community. There's so many different ways to, to be active. One of the things I think the Armenian Assembly has done very well and can be very proud of is its internship program for over 40 years now and over a thousand interns from all across the country, all stripes of life, getting involved in all types of different uh, areas afterwards, whether it's in politics, whether it's in journalism, whether it's in law. This is a great opportunity for Armenian Americans to come to Washington, D.C. and really get a unique, uh, life-changing experience. The Armenian National Committee of America, also based in the nation's capital, has an internship program that focuses on fighting specifically for Armenian causes. Because we have a worldwide diaspora and the largest community of the worldwide Armenian diaspora is right here in Southern California, it's very important for us to have our collective voices heard in the halls of government and policy making and so on. And as a political force, we can influence American policy and have successfully influenced American policy in that we have been able to secure funding and foreign aid from the United States government for the dual republics of Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, we've been able to uh, call for uh, Turkey to be brought to justice and we've gotten a lot of traction on that. Haven't reached our goals yet, but eventually we will. Uh, and we've just been able to mobilize and organize our communities to integrate within American society while at the same time maintaining our cultural identity and our history. At a fundraiser at the Pasadena home of Rafi Hamparian, the national chairman of the ANCA, Congressman David Valadeo from California's Central Valley was brought in to talk about a recent fact-finding trip he made to Armenia, accompanied by Hamparian. So it was a really quick trip, um, and the, the Armenian folks were very, very helpful in making sure that I had a, a very full schedule and got to see quite a bit in two uh, full days. I left California, flew uh, to um, the Yerevan, and uh, landed. The ambassador from the U.S. was there waiting for me. Uh, we had an opportunity to visit the, the Genocide Memorial, visited some schools, uh, met with some locals, got in a helicopter, flew over to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, met with the some folks in the legislature there, um, got a little briefing, did some interviews, and uh, got a briefing from uh, Halo Trust on some of the, uh, the mining activities they've got and how they're doing it. There has never been an Armenian-American elected to the U.S. Senate and only six have been elected to the U.S. House. Stephen Darunian of New York was the first in 1953, and Californians remember Fresno's Chip Pasheyan, who was in office from 1979 to 1991. Two other former congressmen were Adam Benjamin of Indiana and John Sweeney of New York. And currently, there are two long-serving, high-profile Bay Area California women in the U.S. Congress, Anna Eshoo and Jackie Speer. But if you had to name the most successful elected official of Armenian descent, it would have to be Kurken George Zukmajian, who was elected to the California State Assembly, the State Senate, one term as the state's attorney general, and two terms as the governor of California. During his eight years as governor, Duke Majin appointed hundreds of municipal and superior court judges, as well as two Armenian Americans to the California State Supreme Court. City officials and dignitaries from all over the state came out to dedicate the new Long Beach Courthouse, and the guest of honor was the man whose name is on the building, former governor George Duke Majin. Absolutely blown away. And if Duke Majin is the most accomplished elected official among all Armenian Americans, the guy pictured here, Ken Kachigian, has a record as a political operative that's second to none, with Governor Duke Majin and two presidents among those he's worked for. We caught up with Kachigian here at his law office in San Clemente. In the late 1970s, he spent four years here working closely with former President Richard Nixon on his memoirs. This was the beach of Nixon's Western White House. Kachigian has an Ivy League law degree and has written speeches for Presidents Nixon and Reagan. But don't get the impression he started life on third base. Well, I grew up in Visalia, uh, which is about 35 miles south of Fresno. I grew up on a 60-acre farm of uh, walnuts and grapes. Dad was a genocide survivor and uh, um, was born in 
uh, central Turkey in a little village called Çomaklu in the province of uh, Kayseri. His village was purged in 1915, and uh, in 1918 I lost my grandmother, uh, my uncle, and my aunt, and my dad survived. It was at UC Santa Barbara that Kachigan honed his skills to become a great writer. But that college freshman in 1962 was not quite ready for the White House. Well, the secret is, uh, is that I had to take uh, what we call bonehead English in uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I couldn't really write a declarative sentence. And so uh, it was called subject A English, but the, that was a fancy term, but it was uh, bonehead English. And, and because uh, I flunked the entrance essay on writing. While Kachigan was at Columbia Law School, he applied for a job on the Nixon for President campaign. He started out at the bottom of the totem pole, but by the time Nixon was president, Kachigan was on the speechwriting team. To go from, uh, um, you know, driving a tractor in, in the vineyard in uh, Visalia uh, when you're 12 years old to uh, sitting in the in the Oval Office and, and listening to the president instruct you on what he wanted to say. It's a pretty big deal. And it was an Armenian-American who single-handedly inserted the term Armenian genocide in a Ronald Reagan Holocaust proclamation in 1981, Ken Kachigan. Like the genocide of the Armenians before it and the genocide of the Cambodians which followed it, and like too many other such persecutions of too many other peoples, the lessons of the Holocaust must never be forgotten. I didn't want to try to slip something under the table and, or uh, be sneaky about it at all. And so I went through the proper channels to make sure. Now perhaps if this had gone to the State Department, you know, there may have been another concern. Now having said all this, after that statement was put out, there was uh, a lot of consternation and whatnot. But you know, the world didn't come to the end. The world has never come to the end after that statement was said. And diplomatic relations didn't end. And our bases in Turkey were not uh, removed. And so uh, I don't think the world would end if, if President Trump would stand up and uh, observe the army in genocide. <laughs> I think in the American political system, Armenian Americans, like every other American, need to be involved because if we're not involved, we're left out of all of the important decisions that get made in uh, American democracy. You know, we're always involved in a David and Goliath fight because we are a very small community compared to other communities uh, or compared to the United States society in general, but because we're so passionate of our cause and because we are so well organized and committed to our cause, we have been able to really make our voices heard in every level of government from the federal on down to the most local grassroots level. And in doing so, we've been able to build a reputation that has been repeatedly calling us the second most effective ethnic lobby in the United States, second only to the Jewish lobby. For as long as we have people that um, care about these issues, that want to see the survival of our people, so we're not just a footnote of history, we need to be active, not only in the homeland, but also in nations that afford us the opportunity to make our voice heard and be responsible citizens, be that in the United States, be that in France, be that in Australia, wherever it may be. Um, it is no different than what other communities have done, like Jewish uh, Americans have done, um, like Latino uh, Americans have done, and it is what makes, I think, America a stronger nation by giving us that opportunity.